Well, here we are again. Coming around to that time of year, coming around to Christmas and New Year's and all of that stuff. (laughs) Today's EPP bonus episode, I wanted to be kind of a reflection of what a lot of us do uh, on the holidays. That is, reflect. Over the last uh, about 10 years of doing this program, talked to a lot of people, heard a lot of stories, and within that fold, there's been a handful that have touched on Christmas, episodes that have long since left the podcast feeds, the minds of those who've heard them, including myself, uh, or may have never been heard at all before. So just like going through an old photo album at Christmas. This and next week on our EPP bonus episodes, in the season of giving, we are going to be giving them to everyone. So that's right. This EPP bonus episode is published in its entirety. And it's a unique one as well. We're going to take a look back at some Christmas stories from several years ago on the program, a program that I produced uh, that I was really proud of the way we found such creepy Christmas music on. I mean, it really, it was like, wow, this turned out good. Um, It's from about four or five years back, and it's going to be filled with creepy Christmas stories from real people. Then, right after that, we are going to go into a conversation I had many years ago with Jeff Belanger about creepy Christmas. We touch on everything from various lore around the world to an in-depth conversation about Krampus. It's a fun holiday-themed episode for your journey wherever you may be going. So, Pay attention to the road, but turn this up a little bit so you can scare the kids. I know, they got the earbuds on in the back and they're probably not hearing you at all. You're like, hey, listen to this, what? Or or just silence. (laughs) It's for you anyhow. It's our Christmas gift this year. Next week on the EPP episode, we're gonna be listening to an old interview that we did with uh, Sylvia Schultz about various dark Christmas patterns and traditions and stories from around the world as well. Hope you enjoy. My name is Tony Bruski, and from all of us here at Real Ghost Stories Online, Harper, Todd, and Carol, myself, happy holidays. Hope you enjoy. It's the holidays. It's Christmas time. Lots of things are going on. Lots of us are very busy. As adults, this time of year can be stressful, it can be happy, it can be exciting, it can be hellish, it can be a whole slew of emotions. But when you're a kid, the holidays, at least you hope they're going to be a happy memory to look back upon. It's not always the case as we do that as adults. But as adults, and if you're a parent, that's probably your goal. That's probably your wish for your children. Unfortunately, holidays are not always super joyous for kids and not always for obvious reasons, not because they didn't get the toys that they wanted, not because mom and dad are in a tough financial situation, but because something else is visiting the home on Christmas night. And it's not Santa. When I was five years old, I lived in this creepy house as I lay uh, asleep, uh, going to sleep, I noticed this woman entering the bedroom was a female dressed in 1940s dress. In her mouth was a cigarette. Pretty quick at that point, I think, to rule out that this is not an elf. This is not Santa. This is not Mrs. Claus. And hopefully Krampus hasn't been introduced into the picture yet as far as uh, consideration for childhood mythical individuals. But if it's none of those things, what the hell is it? She came by my bed. She was wearing white gloves. And she put her hand over my mouth as if to 
smother me. And as I looked up into her face, she was had yellow eyes with that cigarette burning in her mouth, trying to smother me. How do you react when something like this happens? This is clearly not some random person that broke into the house either. What is going on? It's Christmas night. It's a night where magic is supposed to be happening, but not this type of magic. And I looked on the wall where the, we had a religious icon of Jesus Christ, and I prayed to myself, oh, Christ, help me, save me. And the minute I started praying, she threw up her hands, she screamed, and ran out of the room. And I'll never forget that, what happened that night. Forever etched in that individual's mind when somebody says, the magic of Christmas, a very different picture is painted. Christmas is a time that is heavy with emotions. Holidays are a time that are heavy with emotions. On today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, EPP bonus episode 226. This is our Christmas episode. We will take you to a parking lot on a Christmas night. A secluded, dark, cold, wet parking lot. As a woman begins her walk home after a heavy night of not drinking, eating. She's trying to work some of it off. Strange car pulls up. What happens? Who is this driver that won't leave her alone as she tries to call for help? Takes a strange turn for the paranormal. Then we will talk about a family heirloom passed down generation to generation. A clock that seems to mark a very specific time every single year, even though the rest of the year it is completely out of order. Then we go into the past and we hear a story of a tragic death that takes place many years ago. And we examine the possibility of the girl's spirit still haunting that very homestead where she passed away on, which is now a summer camp. Those stories and more all today in EPP bonus episode 226. From Real Ghost Stories Online, I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. We've all heard this story before. It's late at night. It's a dark parking lot. Person is alone. Person is approached by someone who has nefarious intent. And the story does not end well from there. In our next story, we hear about a Christmas night. Someone trying to walk off dinner. When they're approached in the parking lot by a Vehicle that is actually marked. Marked as a ride-sharing vehicle. Safe, right? Well, not always, especially if you didn't call it. Driver doesn't seem to be, well, safe to drive. Vehicle doesn't look all that safe to be in. And driver persists over and over to try and get the person into the car. What do you do? It's a very scary scenario to be in. Uh, It just happens to take place on a holiday evening. So you can picture the setting of cold, dark parking lot with Christmas lights off in the distance, which should be a somewhat happy evening or occasion, turns into one of the scariest nights for one of our listeners' lives. Take a listen. I've had a rough time trying to share this story because it's caused me to want to move away. It happened on a Christmas night. Usually after Christmas, we tend to eat enough to be able to sleep very well. 
However, for whatever reason, that was not the case. This night, and I decided to burn off some of my holiday calories at the local gym before bed. I always remember to dress bright, especially around this time of year when someone may have any impaired abilities on their way home. I walked to the gym. I enjoyed a good 40 minutes before heading home. It was about 1 a.m. as I walked, and I noticed a car driving slowly. It's a little suspicious. Some people drive slow in parking lots, but I noticed and I started to feel uncomfortable. I decided to walk to the nearest store. I did not bring my purse, but I had a phone case with a spot for cards and had to use the ATM because it was the only card I had on me. I noticed that car parked outside around the far end of the lot. It was dark. I noticed they had a rideshare logo on the passenger side of the dashboard, so it didn't feel too strange. I got bottled water, but the clerk was cleaning up, so I waited a few minutes because it wasn't like I was buying anything expensive. This was when I noticed the car was still parked outside. I mentioned to the clerk that the car might be following me. He told me I was getting worried over nothing. But I decided to walk the opposite direction just to be safe. I noticed the headlights facing my direction as I started walking back to the store. The driver rolled his window down, then in a groggy, almost drunken mumble, I heard a man's voice asking me if I needed a ride. I was declining, and I may have mentioned that I forgot something in the store, out of trying to sound scared. There's only one problem. Now I was scared. I checked my phone to make sure I didn't use any apps, just in case uh, it accidentally summoned a car, but I don't even have this Rideshare's app installed on my phone. So I got back into the store, and I told the clerk that the person was following me. He said it was none of his business and to call the police if I was worried. I thought about it, but he said it was common for those drivers to be around at this time of night. I still didn't feel right, though, so I texted a few friends, and one of them was around, but he had some drinks earlier and said he'd walk me home if I bought him more beer. I figured if you were willing to walk about a mile just to walk me home, it'd be worth it. I was a little worried going to the ATM again, because if that driver saw me going there, they might think I had a ton of cash on me. I bought a cheap 12-pack for my friend, then a few snacks because I noticed it was getting late. He might decide to sleep on my couch. Maybe 20 minutes went by. I noticed the car was gone. I started to think my friend may have changed his mind and didn't bother showing up. I grabbed the items and decided I'd give my friend a call when I got home, and if he was in the area, he could sleep on my couch. I didn't see that car around and began walking home. Instead of walking the opposite direction, I headed my normal path until a car began to drive by me. I heard the window roll down and the same slurred voice, but he asked if I was walking the wrong way home again. I ran back to the store while I heard him offer to give me a free ride home. Got back in the store, called my friend right away, and asked what was taking so long. He wondered why I was so worried until I explained that someone in a car was following me around. He only told me his phone battery was almost dead and not to go anywhere. I could hear he was outside and hopefully close, so I waited there, knowing he wasn't still at his home. There were no cars in the parking lot currently, but I didn't want to risk it again. It always feels the same. Time moves in slow motion, but you just want to be home. My friend eventually showed up. He ignored me and only told me to pretend I didn't know him. He held the door for me, but quickly walked the opposite direction. I was kind of confused. I started to think maybe he'd done something to the driver and was trying to keep a low profile. It made me feel a little sense of safety until another set of headlights began to approach me. I knew it was that driver again. The window rolled down. Right when he was trying to ask if I wanted a ride, I shouted, Go away! I heard keys jingle. I was worried the driver was getting out of his car. I dropped my bag, the beer, and reached for my phone. It wasn't the driver making that noise. I felt footsteps and heard what I could only describe as dropping a brick in an empty trash can. It was my friend who ran full sprint to get that driver away from me. Then we heard tires screeching and we were both yelling. As soon as I noticed me and my friend were the only ones around, I was like a massive weight was lifted off of me. He picked up my bag and the beer and then said, let's go. I was still a little uneasy, but we managed to walk home, and my friend told me to call the police. 
I didn't really have a lot of details about the car other than it was dark, gray looking, and had that ride sharing logo around the passenger side because the headlights are so blinding. Luckily, my friend was there to describe the driver's clothes, the vehicle being a Nissan with a huge dent in the driver's side door. We thought it might be possible that the driver share program might be able to provide their location. He only noticed two digits on the license plate, but they said it increased the chances of finding him. We told the police about it. I also included all the street names where it happened and the direction the driver may have gone. There are basically no other cars on the road, but they couldn't find him. I started to get worried. I really didn't want to go out alone after that. I forced myself to work the next day, then contacted the department to find out if they had at least talked to the driver. They also tried to reassure me a few things after contacting the ride-sharing company. He explained that some people might be driving someone else's vehicle. They might turn their phones off or disable the phone app or the GPS location near airports because those services aren't supposed to pick people up because taxis have contracts to those locations. It's also possible this person may have been driving with different license plates, or maybe we gave them the incorrect information. What made me write in this story was finding out this piece of information. The only close matches to the car that we gave were dead. There were some drivers who drove drunk and were in accidents or nobody in the vehicle survived. I started to remember the driver had slurred speech, and I told the officer it was one thing I noticed that night. I felt a little more scared and decided to talk with my friend who was there. First, I was trying to think rationally, but still wondered things like, what if the person had a weapon? He told me that he saw a huge dent in the driver's side door, so it had to be a physical thing that existed. But he still mentioned getting a clear view of those first digits on the license plate, and it wasn't a mistake. He thought the police department was being lazy. It was late on a Sunday night, and it was one of the few vehicles that were even on the road when he walked to the store to meet up with me. You'd think with all the cameras we have everywhere would have been recorded driving around that shopping center or somewhere in town. When I mentioned the similar vehicle and how the drivers died in wrecks, he brought up that I almost got abducted by Large Marge from that Pee Wee Herman movie in the 80s. The sad part was the only actual evidence of that ride-sharing driver that matched the few vehicles were all ones that ended in accidents where everyone died. I got more scared thinking what could have happened if I somehow ended up in that car. I don't intend to walk around at night anymore, at least not alone. I also wanted to share this story because I haven't heard any similar ones. And people really need to think twice. Don't assume that just because someone has a little sticker or label on their vehicle, you can just trust any strangers. Typically, the holidays are a time that families come together, uh, eating a meal, spending time, sharing stories, arguing, (laughs) however it may go. Eventually, the older generations, as it all goes, pass, and then the cycle just continues on. Oftentimes, there's objects that are in the possession of families that get passed down from generation to generation. Oh, I want grandma's this, so I want grandpa's that. And it gets moved through the family. When one of those individuals passes, the great-grandparent or the grandparent passes, there's a void. There is a void, especially on the holidays. When you wish, you could be there to ask one more question, to hear one more story. Think about the things that you wish you could have talked about when they were there, but maybe too young to ask. In our next story, we have one of those objects. One of those objects that seems to take on a life of its own every Christmas at a very specific time. Giving a very specific sign that although they may be gone, they're still very much present, very much aware of the family. Take a listen. My great-grandmother, my nana, as we called her, at one time owned a black, somewhat rectangular and beautiful mantle clock. Something made in the 1940s that needed a key to wind it. And it would chime 
on the hour in the house. From what I understand, she was a cool lady, a little ahead of her time, mostly in regards to the fact that she never really fit into social norms and never really cared what people thought of her. She passed away in 1982. The clock was left to my grandmother, my Nana's daughter, who had taken care of her in her later years. Her husband, my grandfather, was a car guy and a natural tinkerer who wanted to spruce up the clock a little, went on a mission to clean and restore it, but couldn't find the key. At this point in the 80s, everything is digital, and finding a place to replace the key is difficult and expensive. So essentially, they now have this lovely antique mantle clock as a showpiece because it's stuck at a random time with no way to wind it up and reset it. And a few days before Christmas in 1983, the clock just starts chiming on the mantle on its own. My grandma is in the den and my grandpa's in the back of the house. They both run out and meet each other in the hall, both of them looking expectantly at each other and asking where they found the key. Neither of them found it. It just started chiming on its own at 7.28 p.m., which is important. Let's remember that. But later, my grandma calls my mom to tell her about the clock and how she was freaked out. Didn't understand in the course of her phone call. My mom tells her that she's pregnant with me. A couple years go by. I'm born in 84 and become somewhat obsessed with the idea of my Nana and then this clock. Even as an adult, I have an affinity for antiques, and I'm pretty sure it all started with this clock. Every year as a child, this clock chimes at 7.28 p.m. on Christmas, which is weird all on its own, because it should chime at 7 or 7.30 or 8 o'clock, not... 728. No one in my family ever finds the key. As a kid, anytime I sleep over at my grandparents' house, I have dreams about my Nana. I mean vivid dreams about her being in the hospital bed they had in the den for her. How her hair was still auburn, even in her late 80s. I remember how she had a croaky voice because she was a longtime smoker. Or how she had a crossword puzzle book on her side table, but was awful at crosswords. My family can't explain it because she died before I was born. So how I knew these things is not explainable. The clock then moves to my aunt. She kept it for many years. We were very close when I was growing up. She'd call me a few days before Christmas, come pick me up, sit on the floor in front of the mantle. And then Christmas would come around. It never failed. The clock went on for years. Unfortunately, there has been some strife in the family, and my mother and I aren't on speaking terms. She now owns the clock, and every time family possessions are moved around, we all hope we'll find the key. My mom does message me a few days before Christmas and tell me hi, and then on Christmas to tell me that Nana says hi. It's the only explanation we can come up with. There are two great grandkids. She got to meet my cousin, who's several years older than me. I collect old keys now. When I'm on the hunt, I'm always looking for clock keys. Oh, by the way, I was born at 7.28 p.m. Life in the country, especially the wooded hills and mountains of Missouri, was not an easy place to be 100 years ago especially if there was an emergency late at night. There wasn't an ambulance you could call. There wasn't a helicopter that could show up. Quite often, if you're off by yourself, there wasn't even a doctor nearby to come and help. And if you are stuck in a blizzard and an ice storm, you are at the mercy of your creator. In our next story, we hear of one such tale, deep, in the hills and the wooded areas of Missouri after a massive ice storm. A young girl falls ill. A father goes out for help but does not return, and a mother must find that help some way to try and save her daughter. Does she succeed? I'll let you decide the answer to that once hearing the entirety of this story. 
A quick note about this story, if it sounds somewhat familiar to some of you, we shared a version of it about 1,000 episodes back on our regular program, right when we were getting started. We thought we would retell it in a new and fresh way because it just fits Christmas so. Put it to me by the director of a camp I attended as a teenager. The story begins during the great ice storm of 1924 in Missouri, which left an ice layer six inches thick across two thirds of the state. It took another three weeks for the ice sheet to melt completely. Deep in the forested area stood a cabin where Hannah, her daughter, and her husband resided. Her husband and her daughter's name have been lost to time. As the ice began to fall on December 16th, Hannah's husband and night returned to the cabin, which came as no surprise as he'd weathered storms in town before. The trail through the woods could be dangerous during winter weather. Hannah thought nothing of it, focusing her time on keeping the fire going inside the cabin keeping a pot of tea warm for her and her daughter. 48 hours passed, and still he hadn't returned. To make matters worse, her daughter took ill, having developed a cough, chills, and a fever. As the girl's condition worsened, Hannah became much more worried. Desperation began to creep in. And on the morning of the third day, she struck out towards town in hopes of returning with her husband, the town doctor. The journey to town took eight hours Due to the winter conditions, she first stopped at the Lawson Tavern, a bar with a few rooms for rent on its second floor. Hannah learned that her husband had not chosen to stay there, as she'd presumed. He'd instead had dinner there and braved the storm in an effort to get home. Now frantic, she convinced a local doctor to brave the ice and return with her to the cabin. Night had already fallen when they finally arrived to find Hannah's daughter. Her condition severely deteriorated coughing and shivering violently in the one bedroom of the cabin. Immediately, the doctor gave her a mixture of medicine and tea, piled more blankets on top of her to keep her warm. He then gave Hannah a different mixture of medicine and hot tea to help her sleep. She curled up in the chair next to the bed and nodded off. The doctor awoke to the sound of singing with an eerie cadence. She will leave you and then she'll come back again. A pretty girl is just a pretty tune. Entering the bedroom, he witnessed an oddly calm and collected Hannah pouring sips of tea into her daughter's mouth and gently stroking her hair. Her daughter, however, was motionless and didn't appear to be breathing. Stepping closer, the doctor could see her blue lips and pasty white skin. The girl's eyes were glassy, fixed, and unmoving. In the night... The young girl had apparently passed away. As he stood there, stunned, Hannah turned to him, saying, All right, doctor, she's getting better by the minute. Give my regards to your wife when you get back to town, will you? I'll do that, missus, he responded politely, tipping his hat. Inwardly, he was filled with fear at the sight of the mad woman. When he returned to town, he reported the girl's death to the authorities and Hannah's breakdown to the administrators at St. Joseph State Hospital, where she was forcibly committed for her own good, and from which she later escaped in the early 1950s. Following her escape, there were reports of strange thefts in northwestern Missouri, where people would return home to find food and women's clothing missing, among other things. True valuables like jewelry and appliances were never taken leading to bewilderment on the part of the local police. Hannah's story would have ended here if not for the 1980 construction of a camp and retreat in the forest northeast of Lawson, Missouri. The first week of summer that year, a full group of campers and counselors were holed up inside the lodge, spending time singing and listening to a sermon by the camp leader during a pounding thunderstorm. As night fell, the different groups of campers were escorted to their respective rooms to turn in for the night. A young girl on the northern side of the lodge woke up in the night, needing to use the bathroom. Slipping from the top bunk to the floor as quietly as possible, she jumped from a loud crack of thunder and lightning. Just as she composed herself, another crack of thunder boomed, and the room filled with a brief flash of light from the lightning outside. Gasping with fright, the girl noticed a silhouette in a flash. Someone was standing at the window outside. She ducked to the floor and crept around to the front of the bunk. And peering out from behind the post, she saw a figure outside. 
Standing at the window was an old woman with a wrinkled, hard face and dark eyes. Long, straight white hair hung string-like from her head. Her shoulders were covered with a torn and patchwork cloak. It was drenched and hung heavy from the pounding rain. Neither her thin body nor her craggly face betrayed any hint of emotion as she gazed into the window. Seeing the girl's movement, the old woman pressed an old gnarled palm against the glass and moved closer, squinting for a better look. The girl screamed, waking the camp and raising the alarm, but after another pearl of lightning lit up the room, she saw the woman was gone. The camp director contacted the local police who investigated and searched the grounds but found nothing, save the muddy remains of a palm print on the window. They took a photo of it and filed it, case closed, right? Later that summer, another young girl asked her counselor if she could head back down to the lake where she'd inadvertently left her swimming goggles. They radioed the camp staff that tended to the lake, but they'd already returned to the lodge following the camper's swimming time. Reluctantly, she gave the camper permission to go retrieve them, instructing her to make it as quick as possible. As the girl walked down the gravel road towards the lake, she heard rustling in the woods to her left. Though it startled her, the sound was further off, and she couldn't see anything through the brush. She thought nothing of it. It's probably just a rabbit or a squirrel that she surmised. She continued her walk down to the beach and found her goggles where she'd left them, putting them in her knapsack and turning back up the gravel road. When she made it halfway back to the lodge, she heard the rustling noise again. It was closer now. Against her better judgment, she stepped closer to the woods and tried to peer through the trees. What she saw frightened her. Standing there was a woman with white hair. She wore a brown shirt that appeared to be made of patched pieces of fabric. The hard lines of her face again betrayed no expression, but her dark eyes watched the female camper closely, following the girl's movement as she backed away towards the middle of the road, her hands up in surrender. Despite her age, her arms were lined with taut muscle. The camper was filled with terror at the sight. The woman looked terrifying. She turned and ran all the way back to the lodge, alerting the camp director, who again called the police. Again, they found nothing. They wrote the incident off as a figment of a superstitious girl's imagination. By now, the existence of the white-haired woman was becoming well-known among the different camps that convened at the campground that summer. Hannah's last appearance would prove to be her most dramatic. It occurred in December of 1981 on a very snowy night during a week when a Kansas City church had rented out the campground for a Christmas retreat. After the campers and staff had all retired to bed for the night, a young woman slipped into the restroom to retrieve her coat, boots, gloves, a winter hat, which she'd hidden in the shower behind a curtain. Fully clothed for the cold, she opened the sliding glass door at the back of the assembly area and slipped out onto the porch, where she'd wait for her boyfriend to meet her. Together, they planned to slip out to one of the counselor's cars for a late-night rendezvous. Things did not go as planned. Twenty minutes late, thanks to a counselor who slept lightly, her boyfriend slipped out onto the same porch, finding a set of footprints leading to the steps down to the lower section of the porch. What he found filled him with alarm as the signs left in the snow showed that someone had slipped and fallen down the 30 steps leading to the lower porch. The succession of blood spots showed that they'd also been injured in the same manner. One set of footprints led from the scene of the accident and oddly into the forest. The search party returned to the lodge to put on heavier coats and retrieve their flashlights. They began to follow the trail. Footprints led them ever deeper into the forest past the boundaries of the campgrounds and into a portion of the forest set with which none of them were familiar. Ultimately, they came upon a dilapidated cabin. Giving each other uncertain looks, they drew straws to decide who would enter first. They crept up to the cabin, working the ancient rusted latch on the front door and easing it open slowly and quietly. One by one, the counselors entered, shining their flashlights around the junk-filled room. Remnants of a fire glowed low in the fireplace. Apart from that, the room was littered with random objects, most of them looking very old and rotten. They noticed the opening to the bedroom. They stepped closer. Inside, they found the girl laying on a pallet of cloths covered with a tattered old quilt. A warm cup of tea sat on a wooden crate next to her, and not a towel rested on her head. After she'd been taken back to camp and 
attended to, the young girl asked them where the white-haired woman had gone. While waiting in the snow, she had taken a fall and hit her head. Days, she remembered a white-haired woman gently stroking her hair and singing to her as she carried her through the forest, then falling into a comfortable sleep in the dark of the cabin. She wasn't sure if she'd been dreaming or not until she awoke in the lodge. In the years that followed, Hannah's absence has raised a few questions among campers and the locals in Lawson. After roaming the area for so many years, her abrupt disappearance is troubling. Did she injure herself and become prey to coyotes or some other local animal? Did she decide to move on? Perhaps she, in trying to find her lost daughter, did some strange sense of closure. Finally, when she pulled that quilt over the injured camper. It's likely we'll never know for sure. Hannah, if she still lives, would be over a century old and certainly in no shape to cope with a rough life in the wild. However, as of the late 90s, campers still occasionally left plates of food out for her on the porch of the lodge. And occasionally, we'd return to find the plate empty. So who knows? Was she still out there? Or was it her ghost? Coming back on Christmas night to save a life. the word gifts can have multiple meanings this time of year it often means something that you're going to unwrap say thank you this is great i love it and then you put it in the closet for the rest of the year and go oh yeah i remember i got that who gave that to me can i regive that okay maybe that's not how it usually goes but you know what i mean gifts during uh, the other times of the year on this show, often referred to as the ability to sense something, the ability to feel something that others may not, whether it be empathically, psychically, uh, however you want to describe it. Our next story involves a woman discovering that she has a gift, a gift to see the other side, a gift to see those who have recently passed on. And she discovers it on a Christmas night. Take a listen. I am a medium. I've seen spirits all my life. Starting when I was very young on a Christmas night, I saw two elderly people being put into an ambulance while simultaneously seeing them standing beside the door of the cab as they watched their bodies being loaded in, a white sheet covering them as they were put into the gurney. They both looked at me and then their bodies again. They knew I could see them but seemed traumatized. I was young, not sure how old I was, I've been running around the immediate area outside of my apartment exploring. And when I saw that, I ran back to tell my family of what I'd seen. They were all gathered around the TV hanging out. It must have been a weekend. They all laughed at me because I was a kid who told great stories. These sightings continued my entire life. I had some fear of it for some time until I realized it was a gift and not a curse. When people would, and still do, ask me if I get scared, I say no and explain it this way. Imagine that you're in your home alone and you turn around, and to your surprise, Gandhi is standing in the middle of your kitchen. So you don't have any idea that Gandhi is peaceful and would never hurt a fly, your immediate reaction will be one of fear. It's natural because you don't know who the person is. If a stranger just appeared in your house out of nowhere, you'd be afraid. But if you knew who it was, then the fear would dissipate. You'd simply continue with the communication. So the fear you feel upon the surprise visit of a ghost is natural for the moment, but when you know you have this ability and simply ask who it is and begin communication, you get used to seeing people just show up. Ghosts to me are just like people, only they talk telepathically and seem to have superpowers. We should all be so lucky. When the fear subsides, your gift strengthens, is what I believe. When I worked in property management, a woman was murdered in her home on our property. It was a terrible day for everyone. Media showed up, nosy and wanting a story. CSI was on the property, just like the TV show. 
And me having to escort the family into the apartment after it was released was very hard. I had to go in and see the brain matter and blood all over everything. I figured he killed her with a weapon of opportunity because the lid to the toilet top was missing. I begged the brother to let me have it clean before they go in to see it this way. They did not need to see this to understand what occurred. The brother agreed. I called Hazmat out immediately and they were amazed at what they saw. And I was amazed at what they did and so professional and respectful. I was the liaison for the family and offered some comfort as we sorted out who would have come to retrieve her things, etc. That night, after talking to her brother during the day and making arrangements for her items, I was in my living room trying to decompress from the stress, eating my favorite sour cream potato chips and trying to do something normal that would get my mind off of what happened. I was also sad and devastated for her and her family when suddenly, to my right, she appeared. This murdered woman is standing to my right, saying nothing, just waiting for me to acknowledge her. Now, I've been called the real-life ghost whisperer because it happened so much to me. So honestly, I was exhausted and didn't want to even communicate, but I had to. My instant thought to myself was, I'm just trying to eat my chips. Can I get a break? My compassion has always taken over. And I look at her and I said, hello. She asked me what happened. And I told her, you're okay now. You can move on. Helping your family and your brother and everything is going to be okay. You're at peace. It's okay. Move on. With that, she gave me a satisfied look and slowly faded out just like that. She seemed to be confused a bit, but when I told her it was okay to leave, I saw it was her love for her family that kept her here. Sometimes when someone is taken so quickly, they are slightly confused and in between dimensions. Once I tell them it's okay to leave, they seem to understand it's far better where they're going instantly. I never saw her again. And that gift all started that one Christmas night. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed those ghost stories. We have more on the program for you this week. Yes, you're only halfway through the show. So if you're like, all right... I want a little more ghosty ghost, crispy, crispy, Christmas milk. If you've had a little eggnog, I understand. <laughs> if you're driving, though, I don't. So if you want more of that creepy Christmas stuff, as I was trying to say, we got it for you. Next up, it is a conversation with Jeff Belanger about the origins of some of the holly jolly things we do today and some that we don't anymore hope you enjoy happy holidays everybody this is our christmas special for real ghost stories online and the grave talks it's a special interview with jeff belanger about creepy christmas time In our lifetimes, Christmas has been a holiday focused on happiness, gifts, family, and good cheer. However, going back just a few generations, the holidays that fall in the month of December had a much darker undertone, filled with despair, threats of murder and violence, and malevolent spirits taking over your soul. Why is it then that we don't associate Christmas with the creepy anymore? Is this all about to change? Because today, Christmas seems to have lost most of its creepy. No, it's not been the case. In fact, arguably, Christmas has got it all over Halloween. If you want to talk about dark, scary stuff, Halloween is a time when the veil between the world of the living and world of the dead is at its thinnest. But that's all, right? It's not necessarily, it's, you know, we talk about ghosts and things like that. But Christmas was born because it's a time of fear, of serious fear. You got to think about this. In northern climates, uh, it's the winter solstice. And in in the northern climes, we live in three seasons. We live in spring, summer, and fall, but you try to survive the winter. It's true today. It was more true uh, centuries ago when you were wondering, do I have enough uh, fuel for the the winter? Do I have enough food? Will I survive? Will my house hold up against the snow? Uh, And that, that sound outside, I don't hear that in those three other seasons. That sound of the whipping wind, is it just wind? Or is that the vanquished enemies of the Norse god Odin screaming and trying to get into my house and attack me? 
it's born from fear. And so many cultures held this big celebration to basically say like, okay, let's have goodwill toward each other because I know if my roof collapses, Tony, I might be knocking on your door and saying, can you take my family in for the next few months so we survive this? And you might be doing the same. So we give gifts to each other. So we we share the, the drinking horn one to another, sh- showing that we're equal. We, we have a big celebration of food because we don't know if we're going to survive this brutal season. It's really interesting because you think of, of fall and when you think of Halloween, that really was a time of harvest and, and a time of, of bounty and such. And and so there really wasn't a whole lot of historical reason at that moment in time, unless it was a horrible crop year, uh, to to be in, in fear and, and, and just in a very dark spot at that moment. Winter, Christmas, all that time of year makes much more sense to be in a very depressed state. And in more modern times, it still is. Uh, very much to that, uh, to of that to this day with the cold, the you're stuck in your house, seasonal uh, depression can kick in for many people. Yeah. It, yeah. it is a darker time of the year, much darker if you really look at it emotionally uh, than than fall is. And also literally, right? So you have to remember, especially the further north you go, some of our Nordic ancestors they weren't sure the sun was ever going to come back. It would only be a few hours of daylight. That's scary, right? I mean, will the sun come back? Will it start to, will the days get longer again? It's, there's a fear there. And the other part of it too is, I want you to imagine looking out on a snowy landscape and realizing that winter kills everything it touches. The grass is dead. The flowers are dead. The trees, the leaves are gone. They're dead. I mean, we know now they're they're in hibernation, but they look dead to you. But there's one tree out there on the landscape, one that isn't dead. It's the evergreen. And you look at that and you would say, wait a minute, there must be some magical power imbibed in this tree that makes it stronger than all the others, that it can take the brutal cold temperatures, that it can handle the snow, that it can, it, it can, it's stronger than winter. And so these trees became sacred. And when I would hear that wind whipping outside, uh, I knew I needed to get my hands on some of these branches to protect me because obviously they're stronger than winter. This all started for me years ago, Tony. I was I was hanging my Christmas wreath on my front door and I was feeling rather scroogey that day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, looking at it as like a chore. Okay, I today I have to put up my Christmas decorations. It takes a little bit of time to put up lights and put up the wreath and all this other stuff and it's just another thing I got to do on my house. And I wasn't feeling any sort of Christmas spirit. And then I said, well, "Why am I even doing this?" And it turns out I'm doing this because the, our Norse ancestors would hang evergreen boughs over their doors and windows in the hopes those prickly, powerful needles would keep out the ghosts, keep out the bad spirits, and keep in the good cheer. And when you understand that, suddenly hanging the wreath doesn't seem so much like a chore because I do want to keep out the bad spirits, including my own, right? My own grumpy, grouchy, you know, grinchy, you know, uh, scroogey kind of feelings that can creep in when you look at how expensive and how cumbersome this holiday can be. There's so much going on uh, and it ties back to so many different influences and cultures. But again, all born from fear. It's interesting because we think of it now or, or, d- or don't even think of it now is really what I should say. When you're putting up that garland, when you're putting up the wreath, the last thing anyone, for the most part, is thinking, oh, I'm going to keep the bad spirits out. It's- <laughs> Wait, Tony, I, I got to tell you about the garland because it's such a great story. Yeah. Right? So uh, so the Norse people saw these these evergreens and they said, yes, they're obviously powerful. They When they would hunt animals, deer and whatever, they would take the entrails, the intestines of those animals, and they would drape them around the evergreen as an offering that was the original garland and i want you to think about that when you're stringing popcorn around your tree this year (laughs) what you're really doing is hearkening back to a time when it used to be animal entrails to decorate (laughs) the sacred tree (laughs) i love it which we really want to do a traditional christmas this is what has to go on the list next time i hear It's going to be terrible, the smell, but you got to go traditional. Yeah, that, if the next time my wife or someone says, I really want a traditional at-home Christmas. All right, honey, let's do it. 
<laughs> I'm going to need a deer. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. So it's interesting when we, we dig back into the origin story of so many things that we do, and, and we may think we know why we're doing them, but we really don't. One of the things you touched on earlier here were gifts, uh, gifts yeah. being given uh, essentially it was a bribe, uh, from what I'm understanding, of <laughs> if, if shit goes down in our neighborhood, this, the roof collapses, our house catches fire because the, the wood-burning stove got out of control. I need to be in your good graces to be taken in. So it, it, we, we've had so many origin stories of what gifts are that we're told kind of in fairy tale like fashion. But what is the true story of, of the gift giving? Well, it is a time, you know, like you said, the harvest just went down a couple months ago and now the solstice is setting in. And you got to remember, too, like all over the world, there are four major holidays and they all fall pretty darn close to the solstice and the equinox. Right. Mm -hmm. Spring, summer, fall, winter and so on. There's also half holidays, which is the space halfway between each. Halloween or Samhain is halfway between fall and winter. Those are the half holidays. So this is the big one. Right. So it, it's not just an arbitrary day. It was picked out because it's it's the solstice. The gift giving is, yeah, it, it's also a reminder that we're going to get into a brutal time and we should be on each other's good side. Uh, giving a gift, I don't know, you can, you can look at it, I guess, sort of cynically, like you just said, <laughs> you monster. <laughs> Or you can look at it. It's like, no, actually, you're my neighbor. I care about you. And, and I am grateful for all the little favors we've done for each other all year. And I might be asking a big one should things get real in the it's next few months. It's a bribe. No, whatever. Man, you're you're a Grinch. Maybe we could save your soul here in the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Maybe. I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, of course, there there is the non cynical way of of looking at it, but it, that that is very interesting. That that this is is one of the traditions that was done for so many years, and obviously still is today. But but not for for necessarily the same purpose or the same uh, you know mindset of I want to be in everyone's good graces. Um, you know, when you give gifts today, it's not necessarily so I stay in this person's good grace. Although you probably wouldn't be if you're the only one who didn't give the gift, and every right. you know that would that would put someone in, in bad graces. But, yeah. um, but it, it was very much so more, more sur there was more of a survival instinct, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That, yeah, that's that's certainly probably more more driven that way. But the real star of the show, the real star, the superstar of Christmas is this guy named Nicholas, who was born in the land of Myra from modern day Turkey. And he was born around 270 A.D. And he was born from a wealthy family and he grew up very privileged and he decided to give his wealth away as opposed to keep it. And he would give it to the poor and the needy and so on. And he would drop coins and shoes and things like that. And so he he had this kind of uh, nature of, of giving away all that he had. And so when he died, December 6th, 343 AD, which is a critically important date to our story, December 6th, that became St. Nicholas Day. Of course, he was later canonized, became St. Nicholas, patron saint of uh, children, as well as uh, pawnbrokers and other things. But, uh, but his his, his tradition of giving gifts carried on, and of course the Dutch turned him into uh, Santa Claus or Saint or Santa Claus, as it later became as he got to America and so on. But his day, his day to bring gifts to all the good girls and boys in Europe, still to this day, is December sixth. And the reason that date is important is because the day before December fifth belongs to something else. Mm. <sighs> that day belongs to Krampus. And Krampus is a monster. Krampus is, is covered in fur and he's got hooves instead of feet and he's got horns and a forked tongue and he carries a chain in a scratchy burlap sack or a basket. And Krampus's job is to go around to each house on December 5th and find the bad girls and boys. And he doesn't punish them. He snatches them up, puts them in the sack, takes them back to his lair, kills them and eats them. Boom. No more naughty children. And then when December 6th comes around, Santa Claus or Santa Claus is free to bring toys to all the good girls and boys because that's all that's left. So I got a question about that. When this was uh, in, in or, or, you know, it still is somewhat active in, in some parts of the world. But when this was more like the norm <laughs> and, and, and the, there, there was more crap is going on. Um, how exactly did the parents explain it to the children when on December 6th, little Billy and all of his friends survived? Because if, if you're a kid, you just know 
little Jimmy down the road has been quite the asshole and yeah. and there's <laughs> no way he's going to survive the night and somehow he magically survives I think that would give a lot of children well if Billy can do this all year long and Krampus doesn't get him I guess all bets are off how did this yeah. go down or or was it such a place in time where children just disappeared uh, just for the <laughs> sake of, of, of Krampus to really keep the rest in line so the story comes from German folklore. It was the Germans that gave us a lot of monsters, not just Christmas ones, but, um, you know, those Germans knew how to keep their kids in line. Uh, I don't know if we've talked about it before, but the Sandman story um, is, is original to German, Der Sandman. And they would tell their children, you have to keep your eyes shut at night because the Sandman's coming. And if you're awake, he blasts sand in your eyes, rips your eyeballs out of your head, takes them back to the moon and feeds them to his children. And in the morning, check the corners of your eyes. If you feel sand in there, it means he came, and it's a darn good thing you were asleep. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you would have lost your eyeballs. Like, they just knew how to keep their kids in line. It's all I'm saying. You know, <laughs> I mean, We've lost something over the years. <laughs> we have. We've, we've whitewashed and disnified like, the world. But that's how they rolled just you know, 150, 200 years ago. Yeah. So Krampus came from that same tradition. And so all I can imagine is, you know, t- today or when i was growing up the threat would be sand is not going to bring you as many gifts or maybe bring you none or coal or sticks if you've been bad that's the consequence which quite frankly isn't much of a consequence if you're having a ball being a bad kid all year long not getting any presents well whatever you mm-hmm. know um getting snatched away and being murdered <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sets the bar a little higher, you know? It does. And, I, and so imagine you're a naughty kid, and it's December 4th, right? And your parents are looking at you just shaking their head going, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about tomorrow. And you're laying in bed just going, oh, God. And they're probably out in the hallway with chains, right? Chink, 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 like the chain sound dragging it on the floor. And you're in there just crapping your bed. And uh... <laughs> today the, 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 the children will be in child protective services. Oh, my God. Right. Your parents did what last night with chains? <laughs> yeah. And then if you somehow managed to wake up alive on December 6th, yeah. uh, maybe that was your warning shot. Maybe you're just like, okay, okay, I'm changing my ways. I, I can be <laughs> redeemed. And that's the uh, that's kind of the beauty of it. And so, okay, so here's the thing. If Krampus is a little too much for you, the Germans also gave us the Belsnickel. And the Belsnickel means, it translates to literally Nicholas and Furs. And uh, each community would have one. So like this year, it could be my turn to be the Belsnickel. Next year, it could be yours. And he would uh, have soot and ash on his face. He'd be covered completely in patchwork work, uh, furs. And he carried a switch of sticks. And you would go to your neighbor's house and you'd knock on the door and say, are there any naughty children here this year? And you might say like, well, little Mary here has been great. You know, she's a sweetheart. But Billy, Billy's been bad. And then as the bell snickle, I would take Billy into the backyard, tie him to a tree, and whip his ass with that switch of sticks, beating him into submission. This would be a couple of weeks before Christmas, so he still has some time to get right and and still get some presents by the time St. Nicholas comes around. You know how we have mall Santas and people impersonate uh, Santa yes. today to to do you know the, the have you been naughty or nice? Did at that point in time where there you know what was the equivalent of mall Santas that would walk up to people's doors and and do this uh, just to really oh Bell Snickel really did come last night for Jimmy down the road and it really was just Herb the cousin uh, down the road that uh, dresses up every year and does this and beats the neighborhood children. It, it, yeah. You're darn right. That absolutely did happen. Oh, and not wow. only that, there's this historic home in, uh, in Niantic, Connecticut. Um, uh, they just changed the name, so I forget. But it was like the Smith House in Niantic. And it's this cute little historic home. They decided years ago, instead of doing a Santa Claus event at Christmas, they do a Bell Snickle event. And we get to cover it for a, a PBS segment I did for a, a PBS um, news show. Mm-hmm. And we got to go there and meet him. And now, granted, he doesn't beat the children. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have heard about it already on <laughs> national news, right? Yeah. <laughs> All the arrests and things like that. But um, but he tells stories and he brings candy. Uh, one of the traditional stories is that the bell snickle might walk into a house and toss some candy on the floor. And if you go diving for it without it being offered to you first, you'd get like a whack of the hand with a with a stick. 
Um, but if you wait patiently until he says, okay, now you may get the candy, then you can jump for it. So he's there as kind of like a, a lesson teacher without the consequence of actually killing you. But <laughs> my point is that if this house in Niantic, Connecticut is bringing him back, uh, anyone else can too. That's the beauty of it. In fact, if you ever remember the show, The Office, yes. right? The, yeah. So that was in um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is very much Pennsylvania Dutch country. Uh, the Belsnickel's still a popular figure in Pennsylvania Dutch country. And in one episode, Dwight Schrute dressed up as the Belsnickel. And you can see him holding sticks, holding a whip, uh, and covered in fur. So standing in the uh, the actual office. So when, when characters start to seep into popular culture like that, to me, it, it means, quite frankly, they're making a comeback because maybe we need them. It, it's interesting because I, 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 I often uh, reference uh, Dwight Schrute's uh, reading of Strul Pizza to the children, uh, the cautionary <laughs> ch uh, tales, because I think this is, a, this is great. And, and the thing is, people don't realize it's a real book that this stuff actually existed. And this is what was read to children at one point in time. My girls find it hilarious and slightly, I think, disturbing because they know <laughs> dad's a little bit to the point of like, he may start trying to implement some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you can. Uh, I just I was talking about Krampus just very recently. And a woman came up to me and said, oh, my God, she was she was, in, you know, in her 60s. And she said, when I was a kid, my German grandmother used to warn, you know, Krampus was the threat. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, it was like if it was like December 2nd and you were acting up, your mom would say, Christmas is coming and Santa knows when you've been good or bad. Mm -hmm. And then that was your that was your cue to like straighten up, dude, like, you know, behave. Um, what we did the other 11 months of the year were irrelevant, of course, but we tried in December. And, uh, and so she told me she's like, no, in my family, they'd be like, Krampus, Krampus is coming. And, and so, uh, I mean, they knew they weren't really going to die, but the threat was thrown out there. And that was in her lifetime, which I think is wonderful. Now, this character, Krampus, was wildly popular in the last 20, 30 years of the 1800s, even the first 20 years of the 1900s. There are dozens and dozens of postcards you could see online um, uh, that people would give uh, instead of Christmas cards. You would give Krampus cards. That was wildly popular the world over. And um, and, and so all these monsters, they, they were around right up until a night just like this one in 1931 when it all ended, sadly. What happened? Coca-Cola happened, Tony. <laughs> Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola company said, let's take this Santa figure and use him to shill soft drinks. And they developed a whole campaign that uh, involved this, this jolly old man with a big cookie belly and the red coat with the white trim and the hat everything you know when i say santa claus right now and you see a picture in your mind coca-cola gave you that picture in 1931 he'd already been going through an evolution anyway for the last 20 30 years but at that moment he really became this figure uh twas the night before christmas came out you know decades before that and so all of this stuff comes together but that's a line in the sand where suddenly christmas is all about a time for good things a time for sweet things sugar plums and all that other stuff and that's the night that Krampus uh, got a, a serious blow to the head. He didn't die. Neither did the Belschnickel. Neither of them died. They just were forced back into the shadows. But darn it, man, a few years ago, that Krampus movie came out. Um, Belschnickel, there's Krampus societies popping up. And to me, that says he's coming back because we need them. That's a society decision. This isn't up to a couple people or Hollywood. I mean, this is real, right? This is mm -hmm. the, the society saying... Let's bring them back because we need them for something. Let's figure it out. Why is it? What is it? Do you think that that the society needs with a Krampus figure back uh, in its its midst and into a popular culture uh, in some capacity? We need a consequence, plain yeah. and simple. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. We, we don't have one. The season lost its consequence. We live in modern times. I mean, gosh, it's freezing out. I'll put my heat up to seventy four. You know, I'll put t shirts on and uh, have a drink with an umbrella in it. You know, it's just we don't have. Uh, we live in a in a world where we've been able to control our environment, especially in indoor environments, um, a lot more than our ancestors ever could. And so suddenly we've lost our way of what this season means. And, and when you joked about a traditional Christmas where we're going to put entrails around the Christmas tree, 
But I mean, to me, this this is us getting back to the real roots of it, the real roots, right? The 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 monsters that lurk in the shadows, because there are scary things out there. It mm-hmm. is cold. There is seasonal affective disorder. There is uh, stress, right? I mean, um, you know, I mean, you've seen that meme, right? My favorite Christmas lights in the whole world are the taillights of my family leaving, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like. Where it's a stressful time when it gets gets complex when we put our our families and friends in one room with a holiday that has so much expectations around it. So I think the the consequence of these monsters helps us reckon with our own understanding and and our own struggles ourselves as we go through like, how am I going to pay for this? And it's so expensive. It's so commercialized. It's so this. It's so that. But I think not just these monsters, but a ghost story will save us all. And I remember the song as a kid, Andy Williams. There'll be scary ghost stories and yeah. tales of the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. It was always disappointing going to Grammys because there were no tales of the ghost stories in Christmas is long, long ago. It was just arguing over who gets the last piece of ham. So that's right. I want some ghost stories. Everyone knows that song. Everyone knows the line. And we just go, no one even thinks about it. Mm-hmm. But there was a tradition for the longest time, and and there's a there's a guy that that took it. I mean, it existed before this one guy, but boy, he took it to a whole other level. A guy named Charles Dickens, uh, who wrote a masterpiece called A Christmas Carol, which of course is a ghost story, one of the most popular ghost stories ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and it came out in December of 1843 in England, and that story had more has more to do with the way we celebrate Christmas today and our, our cultural understanding of it than anything else, anything, right? So tr- that, that book blew up. It blew up in Europe, and then it made its way to America in the 1860s when Charles Dickens, it was just two years after the Civil War had ended, and the, the country needed a reason to come together. And Charles Dickens was a big fan of America, and he came to Boston, and he stayed at the Parker House Hotel, and he practiced reading this story over and over because... In Boston, I mean, Boston banned Christmas at one point. No joke. 1681, it was forbidden. You would be fined five shillings if you're making merry, dressing in fine clothing, singing, whatever it is. It was forbidden. And it wasn't recognized as a holiday until 1856 in Boston. And even then, it was just recognized. You still had to work. You still had to go to school. All that stuff. It was not a big day whatsoever and when when Charles Dickens came to America uh, in the 1860s, he started telling. He read his story. He read it in front of audiences, and it changed everything. It went viral, uh, circa the 1860s. People were inspired. Employers started giving their employees the day off the next day. They started buying them turkeys, all of them. Uh, it, it it really it, it really changed the way. Uh, we think. And and the beauty of it, that story in particular, and I, I love it as much as one can love a story, is that we're all Scrooge. We understand that now as adults. We are Scrooge. I am Scrooge. You're Scrooge. We get older. We get more miserly. We get bitter about everything. And suddenly this holiday offers us redemption, redemption that can come in a single night Right? We can start giving to charity. We can be present with our families. We can acknowledge our past, our present, and our future and actually think about our legacy and change everything in one single night. And that is so, so comforting. Uh, and I think that's why this story still works today and works every year and will work for as long as we keep it around. And it's all thanks to four ghosts, right? Mm-hmm. Go- ghost of Jacob Marley the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, and the ominous ghost of Christmas future. And that is amazing, right? That is the miracle of of what this holiday can mean based on so many cultural influences. Um, And you may have noticed, I don't mean to offend our our, our religious friends, but we haven't mentioned Jesus once yet. The thing is, uh, in the Bible, there's only one clue as to when Jesus may have been born. And uh, that clue comes in the book of Luke, and uh, it says that uh, shepherds lay, lay sleeping in their field, keeping watch over their flock at night, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the, 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 the verse. And in Bethlehem, there's only th- there's three seasons where shepherds would stay out all night, and that is spring, summer, and fall, which means Jesus was born either in the spring, the summer, or the fall. If you believe the Bible, mm-hmm. it means there's one season we can rule out, <laughs> and that season we can rule out is winter. Um, 
So, uh, and that's okay. I mean, I don't always celebrate my birthday on the actual day. Sometimes we wait for the weekend, right? Whatever. Sure. Um, so the, the reason it got to be December 25th is because the Emperor Constantine was trying to unify Rome under one religion and one god. And he knew he couldn't compete with Saturnalia, which is the six-day raging party that took place right around the solstice, uh, December 17th to the 23rd, every year. And it had been going since the 3rd century BC. So he knows he can't compete with this pagan festival of orgies and gift-giving and festivals and feasts and all this other stuff. So he's like, look, I can add a day to it. The other thing about Jesus is that uh, Jesus was a commoner. That was the point, right? He didn't come from kings and, and queens. He came from, uh, he was born in a manger, humble beginnings. And in those times, uh, the everyman did not keep track of his birthday. Only kings and queens and royalty kept track of their birthday. So, uh, so it really wasn't important to the Jesus story or to the Bible. That's not the critical story. So Constantine's trying to sell this king of kings to the Romans. And he's like, of course he has a birthday. It's December 25th, right after Saturnalia. So we keep the party going. December 24th, Christmas Eve. 25th becomes Christmas Day. And boom. Um, so the very first Christmas on December 25th was 336 AD. And that was because of Constantine. Constantine knowing that Jesus needs a birthday because he's noble now and, uh, and, and trying to sell it to these pagan masses. So that's where that comes from. But really, he's the most minor part of the story. It's really St. Nicholas who's the star. Mm -hmm. in, Christ in Christianity, the most important holiday is Easter. That's the defining holiday. Everybody's born. That's no big deal at all. Unless, you know, you're a woman giving birth, which you and I will never know. <laughs> but, <laughs> right? But, but, I mean, everyone's born but nobody dies and comes back. That's sure. what Christianity hinges on. It hinges on the Easter story, not the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so when people get upset that we're not talking about Jesus at Christmas, that's because it's actually not really the most important part of this day if you're looking at a historical folklore and cultural uh, example. Yeah, it, it's very interesting to to note that that part of the story of it was why it was placed where it was. If you're looking at it from kind of a modern perspective, he created an after party uh, of That's the right. other party. Yeah. So Christmas was the the date that was given for it to recognize the event of the birth was essentially an after party. It, it wasn't to, to discount the birth date or anything like that. It's just they didn't know the date. So that's where they they put it at the time. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, th and there's been various like biblical scholars who believe they've come up with the actual date. And I, I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. I just know what the Bible says. And the Bible does not say he was born on December 25th. He no. says shepherds were laying watch in their field. And we know in that area, that's three seasons that he could have been born in. That's that's very interesting. So a lot of our audience here, you know, tens of thousands of, of people, when I look at our, our statistics uh, of, of our listenership, and it skews heavily uh, with women, uh, 35, 54. That, that's our, our big chunk of the audience. And and I'm sitting here, a man of, uh, I think I'm 37 now, yes. Um, I, I, I lose track of that myself. Uh, and, and I'm all about integrating Krampus and some of these things into into the um, uh, into the holiday, but I can guarantee my wife and and the nice women that I stand out at the bus stop to pick up my daughter every afternoon with would not be so keen. And they are our core listeners of integrating Krampus or any of this <laughs> into the holiday decor. Anything they're finding on HGTV for decorating. How <laughs> can you or, or give us give us your argument? Give us a plea to them of how some of these things can in fact be integrated without killing the children or the little asshole Jimmy down the road or anything like that. Uh, but, but you know, in, in some sort of, I guess, I don't want to say Disney-fied, but uh, mm -hmm. non-violent way of integrating okay. some of these things. Let's go to Sweden okay, and talk about the Tompton. The Tompton of Sweden is, uh, I guarantee you, if you've ever been to like a, a craft store around Christmas, you've seen uh, a depiction of the Tomton. He's a little guy with a big, tall red hat and all beard, right? You don't even see the face. You just see the big white beard that goes all the way to his feet, right? Mm -hmm. That's the Tomton. And, and what he is, is he's a helper elf. And he sticks around your home all year round and he helps with the chores. He helps with the animals in the barn and so on. And he keeps you in line. If you're not doing right by the animals or doing right with your housekeeping, he's known to come in and slap you around a little bit and get you back in line. He's critically important to the house. 
All he asks is that on Christmas Eve, you leave out a bowl of sticky rice, sweet rice pudding for him uh, as, a, as an offering, a food offering. That's all he asks, this Tompton fellow. And while you might say, like, well, leaving out a food offering on Christmas Eve sounds rather pagan for my taste, Jeff. I don't know. You ever leave out cookies and milk for <laughs> Santa, right? Uh, and so if you look at the behavior and the description of this Tomden, to me, he sounds awfully darn familiar to uh, a wildly popular uh, you know, creature today that we call Elf on the Shelf, <laughs> right? He sticks around. He reports back. He watches to see if you're good or bad. Um, you're not supposed to touch him. And, and, and you know, he or she, if you go with a female elf on the shelf, shows up uh, around the holiday time and becomes this, this, um, this figure. So you're already doing so many of these things. You just may not understand the, the folkloric roots of them. So you could do elf on the shelf or you could do what I do in my house, which is Krampus in the corner. <laughs> I and love every it. morning he's standing in a different corner, you know, just the standard seven foot tall monster that yeah. uh, I, I move around. You know, some days my daughter wakes up and he's he's right at the foot of her bed. It's cute. It's really it's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the therapy that she'll have to go through one day. <laughs> I know. I'm starting a GoFundMe for that. Exactly. Now. You can all give generously if you can. <laughs> So, yeah, so you get so the thing is, like, I think it's important that we sh shoot, if nothing else. How many of you go see a Christmas carol, like <laughs> a either at a community theater or, or a big theater or watch it on television sure. every year? So many of us do that. That is a ghost story. That is the consequence. Scrooge is the consequence for living a bad life, right? He's a bad man. He's stingy. He's greedy. He's mean. He doesn't help his fellow man. Uh, and that story reminds us of it. I remember being a kid and watching the face come through the door of Jacob Marley when Scrooge goes to the house. That scared the hell out of me as a kid. Uh, it's a frightening moment. And, and now as an adult, I'm like, I, I welcome it. Like, I, I need to be scared a little bit this time of year. I need to be reminded because we all become that Scrooge character. Mm -hmm. So the, these, these are the literal consequences of the holiday. The monsters, the ghosts, they offer us that. Uh, they offer us things Santa Claus can't. Santa's the reward. And I would never want a Christmas without him. Please, we need him. I love him. Right? And, and, and he's great. And he's the payoff. He's the, he's the right off into the sunset. Mm -hmm. But leading up to him, I say... We need these things, even if we just talk about them, even if we just kind of share the stories over some hot cocoa a few weeks before Christmas. I think they they offer us something. I think they do. In other countries, uh, are they still uh, as big on these monsters, or their origin uh, stories as 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 they once were, or has worldwide things been a little toned down uh, on these? It, no, I think they're coming back globally. Okay. Uh, so in Wales, there was this really obscure legend called the Mari Lord, which uh, it's a Welsh word that means the gray mare. And on Christmas Eve, the gray mare rises from the grave and goes door to door begging for uh, food and most preferably alcohol. And what would happen in these small Welsh villages is that men would dress up like you knew they weren't fooling anybody but they they would be under uh they might have the 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 skeleton head of a horse on top uh, of a sheet and there would be men underneath and they would go door to door and they would uh if you didn't offer them alcohol or food they might have some sort of consequence for it and this was pretty popular you know 120 years ago or so and it never quite went away but suddenly there's now parades in wales where these things are on display um, and you talk about Krampus. So last year I had the opportunity to film, um, th there's a, near me, there's an organization called the New England Krampus Society, mm -hmm. which by the way, is just one society among many Krampus societies all over the world. And I went to their Krampus ball, dude, it was amazing. <laughs> like, <laughs> run, don't walk. Right. It's all I'm saying. Wow. And, uh, it was so that they, all these people got together and they went, I mean, when they weren't here, you know they're at like cosplay conventions and stuff with, with like <laughs> the most amazing costumes. But they were 
awesome. Like the costumes were incredible. We filmed it all for PBS. We're, we're working on a documentary um, on, called Creepy Christmas. And we filmed everything. There was a live goat there, which since that party, I'm like, I will no longer go to any parties that don't feature a live goat. Like that's my new <laughs> bare minimum standard. And and the the costumes and the 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 girl Krampuses and the boy Krampuses were uh, just incredible. So and then they would do a parade down the street and people would watch. And I just say this is this is great. It's coming back. That's all I have to say. It's coming back. And I think it's going to be exciting to see how more and more of these things inch their way uh, back into our, our normal culture uh, over the next many years. It, just perspective wise, it, it's always interesting to hear dates uh, of of when things began as an adult to hear those dates. Because when you're a yeah. kid, you think, oh, God, that was a long time ago. And then you start to do the math and you go, oh, holy shit. If I, I was like to look back on that many years now, like that really wasn't that long ago. It, it, it's it's all about perspective on so many of these things of what we view as, you know, ancient history or, or a long time ago. And, and really so many of the, the modern things we do with Christmas don't go that far back from, no. you know, us. <laughs> no, not at all. Not yeah. just, you know, two, two generations, right? That's not that far at all. And there's so many pieces of it you know it, it it's and to me it's fun I, I i know we're getting close on time but but can i leave you with a gift can i yes. can i ruin ruin something for you go for it so um uh baby it's cold outside is by far the number one date rape holiday song right i mean it's creepy <laughs> right like right like what's in this drink like honey you just got roofied right like we don't have to spell it out the song is creepy by today's standards it just is right mm -hmm. and and a lot of radio stations don't play it however there's a song that you know, that everyone knows, that's so much more creepy when you pick it apart. And I thought maybe as a final note here, we could we could do that. Uh, the song is called Jingle Bells. Okay. And the thing about it is, number one, it is not, nor has it ever been, a Christmas song. Christmas is not mentioned once in the song at all. Um, but, of course, we only hear it at Christmas because it's about a sleigh ride. And so, anyway, I get that. It was written in Medford, Massachusetts by a guy named James Pierpont uh, in 1850. So uh, all that aside isn't as important as picking the song apart. So the first verse of the song, um, and I'm going to translate for you. I'm going to translate the language from 1850 English to our modern understanding it. Standing of it. So dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh, pretty straightforward. Over the hills, hills we go, laughing all the way, bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. Okay, spirits. You could think that means your mood, but it could also mean alcohol. Mm -hmm. Spirit was the common word for alcohol back then. So making spirits bright, so we might be drinking and sleigh riding, just saying, oh, what sport to ride and sing a slang song tonight? Fine. First verse. Second verse. A day or two ago, I thought I'd take a ride, and soon Miss Fanny Bright, Miss Fanny Bright, was seated by my side. And she's hot. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> she's smoke, song, smoke show, right? The horse is lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot. And and keep in mind, by the way, spirits. So we have alcohol. We have Miss Fanny Bright. And this is a time when single men and women were not supposed to be alone, unescorted, but on a sleigh ride that only seats two with alcohol? Eh, mm -hmm. We could be, right? So anyway, horses lean and like misfortune seemed his lot. He got into a drifted bank and we, we got upsot. Here, I'm sorry, we're, we're working blue now, but this is what happened, right? These are the words, not mine. He got into a drifted bank. Upsot can mean like flipped over, but it's also a slang term for drunk. Now, the thing is, it says he got into a drifted bank and we, it says we twice, like we, maybe not necessarily the sleigh. Maybe it was we, me and Miss Fanny Bright, who got upsot or turned over, right? Mm -hmm. And to prove my point, the third verse says... Uh, a day or two ago, the story I must tell, I went out to the snow and on my back I fell. So I'm on my back. A gent was riding by in a one horse open sleigh. He laughed as there I sprawling lie, but quickly drove away. Dude, you're driving through a snowy road today and you see a car flipped over on a desolate road and the, the lights are on, the tires are still spinning. You are obligated to pull over and help. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Of course you are. You're a decent human being. Now, I'm saying if you interpret this correctly, uh, he pulled over because he saw a, a sleigh in a drifted uh, in a drift bank. And the reason he laughed and drove away is because 
the sleigh was not upsot, but the boy and the girl were upsot. So if you pulled over, a car was just pulled over on the side of the road and you kind of slow down to see if they need assistance and you see, oh man, they don't need any assistance whatsoever from me. You might laugh and drive away, right? That's what happened. And then the last verse says, go it while you're young, take the girls tonight, sing a slang song, just get a bobtail bay to 40s of speed, hitch them to an open sleigh and crack, you'll take a lead. He's saying, guys, this worked for me. Get some booze, get a girl, take her out to a drifted bank and boom, you're in like Flynn. I'm not suggesting <laughs> meatloaf ripped off paradise by the dashboard light, <laughs> but I'm not saying he didn't rip it off from James Pierpont either. This was the original booty call song and you will never hear it the same way again. Wow. You know, I don't even recall uh, us ever singing verse two and three. It seemed they edited those out for a a reason, it seems. Because they're X-rated. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Well, on that note, happy holidays, everyone. (laughs) Have a very creepy Christmas. That wraps up this week's EPP bonus Christmas episode, available to everyone EPP or not, but that's a sample also of what we put out every single week as an EPP. When you sign up, you get access to all of those archives, hundreds of episodes, uh, almost uh, 450. We're, we're getting close to that mark. It's crazy. You also get access to all our bonus episodes, advanced episodes. Everything is commercial free. It's the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories. So if you want more of all this, check it out. Sign up on Apple Podcasts. Even try it for three days free there or patreon.com slash real ghost stories or our website, ghostpodcast.com. Until next time, I'm Tony Bruschi. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays.